Amen. Robert, it is good to have you back with us. If you would, come here and do some therapy exercises <laughs> to show us how well you're doing. Okay. Okay, Robert, we're glad that you're back and glad that you're doing so well. Are you going to stay on the stool the whole message? Okay. Is that my signal to be brief or? Thank okay. You, it's good to see you today. I will give you a bit of report. We had a bit of a health uh, health scare during Sunday school and uh, the ambulance came and Chester picked up Chester Yerby and uh, Billy went with him and I just had a chance to visit with Billy and his all of his vital signs have returned to normal. He's had a little bit of a blood pressure scare or something and he's going home here in just a little bit. So we're glad that Chester and Elner are, are doing well this morning. You have your Bibles. I would ask you to turn to Mark chapter 9. The Sunday prior to Ash Wednesday, which is the beginning of Lent or our preparation for the coming of Holy Week, is Transfiguration Sunday. It's always this Sunday. But the Transfiguration is one of those events in the gospel that throughout the centuries Christians have not been clear on what to do with. You can go through all the major creeds of the faith. And Caleb, if you would, there's, this is the middle section of the uh, Apostles' Creed where it makes all the statements about Jesus Christ. I believe in Jesus Christ, God's only Son and Lord, who was conceived by the Holy Spirit, born of the Virgin Mary, suffered under Pontius Pilate, was crucified, died, and was buried. He descended to the dead, and on the third day he rose again. He ascended into heaven. He is seated at the right hand of the Father, and he will come to judge the living and the dead. Not a mention of the transfiguration. Jesus visiting with Moses and Elijah when the Spirit of God comes upon that mountain and he is transfigured, the Scripture says, into dazzling white. And we don't have a clue what to do with it. This morning I want to ask us to take the long view of the transfiguration, to look at where the transfiguration falls within Scripture. I want to begin in the 8th chapter when Jesus has just fed the 4,000. He has used seven loaves of bread and a few fish and fed 4,000 men plus all those who are with him, maybe a crowd of 20,000. We're not sure. They only counted the men under the Roman counting system. And there's 4,000 men. Jesus takes a few fish and seven loaves of bread, and he feeds all of them. Now, after he has fed them, the Sadducees and the Pharisees walk up to Jesus and said, Can you give us a sign that you are the Messiah? And exasperated, Jesus sighs and said, Why is this generation always asking for a sign? And he takes the disciples, they leave and they get on a boat and they begin sailing across the Sea of Galilee. While they are sailing, the disciples forget, began to fuss at one another. Nobody thought to bring any food. Here they are in the boat sailing across the Sea of Galilee. Who knows how, it's gonna, how long it's going to take? It's about seven miles. Who knows if the wind is strong or if the wind is light or if they're rowing? Who knows? But nobody brought any food. And Jesus rises up and he listens to the, uh, to the, the gossip or the bickering among the disciples. And he says to them, are you infected with the same thinking as the Romans? Do you think like the scribes and the Pharisees? Do you not know that I will provide? And somebody says, foolishly probably, Lord, we don't have anything to eat. And he said, did you not just witness what happened? How many baskets were left over? And they said, 12. And he said, oh, can you not believe? They sail across. They reach Bethsaida. When they reach the shores of Bethsaida, a blind man comes up to Jesus and asks him to heal him. This is the one where Jesus bends over, spits in the dirt, makes a paste, puts it on the man. And the man, when he removes it, he says, can you see? And he says, well, uh, I can see, but it's like the people are like trees. So Jesus spits in his hands and pats it on his face one more time, and the man can see. 
That's an odd story. It's the only time that Jesus healed someone and needed a second chance. And the scriptures offer no reason for that second chance or that no reason need for that second chance. But Jesus takes two tries and he heals the man and he walks off seeing everything. Jesus takes the disciples to a quiet place, which is his goal in the beginning. And he begins to tell them who he is. They go to Caesarea Philippi. Jesus said, who do the people say that I am? And one of the disciples said, well, there's some who say you're John the Baptist. There are other people who say you're Elijah. There are other people who say you're one of the other prophets. Jesus said, well, who do you say I am? And Peter jumps up and he says, you are the Christ, the son of the living God. Jesus blesses him for his saying. And then Jesus pulls them in close. And he tells them that the, the path of the Son of Man is that he's going to suffer, he's going to die, but he will rise again. And Peter jerks him by the collar and pulls him aside. And he said, listen, don't ever talk like that again. Don't ever say those words again because the, the Messiah that I'm following is victorious. The Messiah that I'm following is going to throw the Romans out of Israel, throw out the corruption in the temple, and raise up a place of holy worship. You are not going to suffer. And Jesus said to him, get thee behind me, Satan, and push Peter to the background. That's the eighth chapter before we come to chapter 9. Verse 2 of Mark chapter 9. Six days later, Jesus took with him Peter and James and John and led them up a high mountain apart by themselves, and he was transfigured before them. And his clothes became dazzling white, such as no one on earth could bleach them. And there appeared to them Elijah with Moses, who were talking with Jesus. And then Peter said to Jesus, Rabbi, it's good for us to be here. Let us make three dwellings, one for you, one for Moses, one for Elijah. He didn't know what to say, for they were terrified. And then a cloud overshadowed them, and from the cloud came a voice, This is my son, the beloved. Listen to him. And suddenly when they looked around, they saw no one with them anymore but only Jesus. And they were coming down the mountain. And he ordered them to tell no one about what they had seen until after the Son of Man has risen from the dead. As I said, it's one of those stories that we're really not sure what to do with in the Scripture. Jesus has become transfigured. He's dazzling white, whiter than any bleach that's available. Moses, the giver of the law, is there. Elijah, of the greatest of prophets, is there. And they are visiting when Peter rushes into the midst, always thinking about Israeli tourism, and says, let us build three tabernacles. People can take pilgrimages, and they can come to the spot where you were transfigured. It would be one for you, and one for Moses, and one for Elijah. And people will come, and they will worship at this place. And while Peter is speaking, a voice comes from above this is my son, the beloved. Listen to him. Now, the first time God speaks, back in Mark chapter 1, Jesus has been baptized, and as he comes up out of the water, the Spirit descends from heaven and comes upon Jesus, and a voice comes from above and says, You are my son, the beloved, with whom I am well pleased. And then the Holy Spirit cast Jesus out into the wilderness for 40 days of trials and temptation. What kind of Messiah would he be? Would he turn rocks into, rocks into bread and feed the people? Would he be the kind of Messiah who could jump off a tall building and angels would catch him and people would ooh and awe at his showmanship? Would he be the kind of Messiah who stands on top of the mountain and controls all the empires of the world? Each time... Jesus rejected every one of those to choose the path that the Lord has for him, that the Son of Man will suffer, die, and be raised again. 
Now the voice booms from above, and this time it's not for Jesus. This time the voice booms for the disciples. This is my son. Listen to him. Listen to him. It seems like at this point in the story, there would be like a light would go off in the head of the disciples. Maybe we ought to pay better attention. Maybe we ought to set aside what our intentions are for what God's intentions are. Maybe we ought to listen to Jesus' teachings a little more clearly. You would think with this kind of experience, with the transfigurations, Moses, Elijah, everything that happens, they would say, maybe we need to pay more attention. But did they? All you have to do is continue reading that ninth chapter. And when you get to the 30th verse, they went on from there and passed through Galilee. And he did not want anyone to know it. For he was teaching his disciples, saying to them, The Son of Man is to be betrayed into human hands, and they'll kill him, and three days after being killed, he will rise again. But they did not understand what he was saying and were afraid to ask him. Time after time after time, Jesus talks, and they don't listen. Igor Stravarius, the great composer, said, said, it's one thing to listen. It's another thing to hear. He said, even a duck will hear. It's one thing to listen. Now, if he's applying that to music, how much more is it for the written word? You know, some of us have a History Channel view of Jesus. When I say History Channel view of Jesus... We talk about the history of the Roman Empire. We talk about this Jesus that appeared on the horizon, was there briefly. We talk about some historical documents that have his name on it that mention he was crucified. And we just let him pass through history and we don't pay attention that he was the Son of God. Born of a virgin, as the creed said, we saw earlier, the Son of God transfigured on the mount. But do we listen to him? Oh, we might. We might hear him. But do we listen to him? He said, follow me. He said, leave father and mother and all in the past and follow me. I heard it. But I don't know if I really listened Jesus said, you give them something to eat. The disciples just expected Jesus just to conjure up food out of nothing after the feeding of the 4,000 and the 5,000. Jesus just makes something up. And one time Jesus said, use your own resources. You give them something to eat. Did you hear it or did you listen? Jesus said the first will be last, and the last will be first. Whoever's first is slave to all. Now, I've heard that, but I don't know if I've really listened to it. Here's another one. If you have anything against anyone, forgive them before you pray. In Mark chapter 5, Jesus has been healing a woman who reached out to him. She has issues of feminine issues of healing, and she reaches out and touches Jesus' garment, hoping that just a touch will heal her. And when she touches him, Jesus feels the power go out of him and into her, and then he begins searching, who touched me, who touched me? He is dealing with her while a Roman centurion whose daughter is dying waits impatiently beside him. She is dying. He needs Jesus to hurry up. He asked him. He was the first one at the boat. This woman has interrupted their travels. Jesus needs, the the centurion needs Jesus to move along. 
<coughs> excuse me. And while they're standing there, somebody from the house shows up and tells the centurion, don't bother the teacher anymore. She's dead. And Jesus turns to the centurion and he says, don't be afraid, only believe. Now, I've heard that, but have I listened to it? A few years ago, I read Michael Crichton's book, Before He Passed the State of Fear. And it's kind of, it's not Jurassic Park. It's kind of a conspiracy theory book. But there's enough in it about the way we live that you don't know if it's a conspiracy or if it's just human nature. But he believes, he puts forth in there that the powers that be in this world, the media conglomerates, the governments, always need us to be a little bit fearful about something going on in the world we can't control. So they give us stories that we can't control. Abby, I, I really need a drink. Could you grab me something? <coughs> the things that we can't control. And so they give us stories enough about North Korea that we don't know what's going on, but we're uncertain. They feed us stories about super germs and then the flu it causes just enough fear that we live dependent upon these powers and this government to take care of us now i don't know if that's right or not but i'm going to tell you a story that's going to put just a little bit different fear in you when you go to the gas pump our good friend nolan sitting over here nolan got assaulted at the gas station in Littlefield this morning driving up here. One gentleman ran into him, knocked the wallet out of his hand, another gentleman scooped it up, and they were on their way to the car before he could even gather what direction they went. Now, <clears throat> what that story does for me, thank you, Abby, is causes me to be more aware the next time I go to the gas station and that the people driving down the highway might think he's lost his mind because he's spinning in circles looking around all the time. Jesus said, don't be afraid, believe. Last uh, December, David and Jody Wood gave us a copy of a book written by David's cousin Amy called Giving Up Gore. It is the story of 2010 at their cabin near Gunnison, Colorado. They have behind their cabin a swift flowing irrigation ditch that makes its way into alfalfa fields. And Amy and her college roommate have got their kids in the house. There's all, everybody's under six, five of them. They've given them baths. She's dried gore. She has told him, don't run off. She put a diaper on him, put a T-shirt on him. She said, I need to go get your pajama pants. Stay right here. And it's at this point in the story, understandably, that her mind is a little fuzzy about what happened next. But she goes back to get the pajama pants, and she probably tends to another child for just a second. Comes back with the pajama pants, and he is not there, which is not uncommon for him. But he has now gone out of that room, downstairs, out the back door, and made his way to that irrigation ditch in which he has fallen into. 20 minutes later, Coach Wood, David, discovers him in that water, pressed up against a log in a fast-moving stream. I'm going to skip a lot of these emergency details. You know how they go. CPR on the bank, calling the ambulance, trip to the hospital in Gunnison, a helicopter ride from Gunnison into Denver, and then a three-hour drive into Denver to the children's hospital. And when they get to the children's hospital, one of the doctors comes in and says, he's been underwater in cold water 20 minutes we know of. 
his brain is going to swell. We would like to try an experimental treatment where we're going to keep him cold for three days and try to keep the brain from swelling. We're going to put him in a medically induced coma, put him on a ventilator, and keep him cold for three days. And they agree. It's all experimental. But what that does, and this is, in my opinion, the best part of the book and the story, is they now have three days with no progress, three days with no regression, three stable days to sort out what do we really believe as Christian people. They tell the nurses, Amy says, we told the nurses and people that came by from the church and family and friends, we all said, God's sovereign, he's in his hands. She said, I said that over and over again. But she felt it welling up inside of her, this crisis of faith. She's sitting in the cafeteria with her parents, when, and she just stands up, walks out the hospital door, walks down around downtown Denver, finds an empty parking lot, and begins making laps around that empty parking lot. Walking round and round, raging, arguing, fussing with God about these circumstances until finally she collapses on the sidewalk and she is sobbing and she is praying and she says, Lord, I, I want him back just like he was on July the 6th. I want him back physically, I want him back mentally. I want him back every way we can get him back on that day. And she said as she sat there, there was epiphany went off in her head. Lord, I'll trust you no matter how it turns out. I'll trust you no matter how this situation resolves itself. You will be God, and we'll trust you. She said that verse from 2 Timothy kept coming to my mind. Even when we're not faithful, God is faithful. Now, you all know the story. He makes a miraculous and rapid recovery. When he wakes up, the steps begin to come, and they come quickly. And within a very short amount of time, he's back to the same kid he was before he fell in the ditch. But Amy says, there were other people in that ICU unit who had very similar stories and not the same results. And she tells one of a young boy who died, and they tried the very same three-day cooling procedure and he, he lived, but he did not recover. And she said, we look at their faith. They held on to God when it didn't work out the way they thought it would. Jesus said, don't be afraid. Believe. Now, I know you heard it. But did you listen to it? Did, did you listen to the words of Jesus? Because the disciples, they had story after story when Jesus told them the Son of Man is going to suffer at their hands. He's going to die, be buried, and raise, be rose again, rise again. And they said, oh, no, no, no. Listen to the words of Jesus. Easter's coming. Listen. Trust him. Listen. Let's pray together. Our Heavenly Father. Every one of us have circumstances in our lives. Father, we've had what we wanted in front of your intentions. We had visions for how life would be, how circumstances would be, how finances would be, how careers would be. And we've been more set on making sure things fit our vision than listening to your word. 
Father, help us in this coming season of moving toward Easter to listen to your word, to not be afraid, to trust, to do what we can to glorify you. Help us, Father, to listen to your word in ways that change our lives. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. This morning, during our time of invitation, we give you the opportunity to follow the example of these four who have stood in those waters of baptism and said, I believe that you come forward and say, I believe that Jesus Christ is Lord and Savior. Perhaps you're here looking for a church home. Come and join with us. Perhaps you have a need in your life you'd like to pray about, and we'll try to listen together. Whatever the need in this hour, let's respond to the calling of God and listen to his word. Let's stand and sing together.